Hi, everybody. This is Father Paul Turner from the Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph in Missouri. I'm offering my second presentation today for the retreat for liturgical ministers of the Archdiocese of New York. I'm very honored to be with you all, and I hope and pray that the time that you spend together today will be of, of great benefit to, to all of you together. For the second topic of my presentations, I'd like to reflect with you on Holy Week. This is um, an important part of the spiritual life of all Catholics. And I know that those of you who assist the liturgy in different ways by performing different ministries, you have a special love for the liturgy of the church and for all that it has to offer. So these, these special days are days that are just exceptionally important for you. So I'm sharing with you now uh, a screen that will show you slides throughout my presentation today. You'll find uh, a copy of all the slides I'm going to show you on my website, paulturner.org. They'll be up there near the top, and these will be available for you for a couple of days. So even after the talk, if you want to go back and review any of the points that I've made, you'll be able to find uh, the outline here for, for you to follow. So let's walk through some of the events of Holy Week and use this as a time to recall uh, what you've experienced in the past or to prepare for things this year. Of course, this year, 2021, is going to be very different because we're still coming out of the pandemic. We have concerns about what we can do, what we can sing, what we can touch, how we express ourselves. We will, we will find a way to honor the, the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, even in the midst of this very difficult time. One thing you, you may notice in the, the last two weeks of Lent is that some of the images in church may be covered. Uh, in some churches, people cover the crosses and the statues for the last two weeks of Lent. It is optional if, uh, if you're in one church that has it and you're in another church that does not, everybody's doing it the right way. You, you have uh, a choice to use this or not. For those that, that use this particular tradition, uh, it has various interpretations and meanings. It, it can speak on, on different levels. I guess I like to think of it as an extension of the, the Lenten fast, whereas we spend so much time fasting from food, from what we taste and smell, uh, during the last two weeks of Lent, we actually fast from some things we see, some, some of the beautiful images in our church. They all help us focus our attention more on the liturgy that is underway. So it's something that could begin on the fifth Sunday of Lent. Uh, if you do experience it, that's, that's why. It's, it's an old tradition that some places retain. The title for Palm Sunday, his full title in the Missal now, is Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion. Both these uh, aspects are important to us. We, we commonly think of it as the day of the palm branches because the, the ceremony is so much uh, impressed within our minds. And yet, you recall that in place of a reading from the gospel of someone, we actually have the proclamation of the passion from one of the gospels. And so this becomes uh, an important dynamic in the whole celebration of Palm Sunday. We call it of the Lord's passion because we're going to experience the Lord's passion even in this celebration. The opening of the ceremony can take place in three different ways, and I'll explain those in a moment, but, but I'd like you to know that it's called a commemoration, and I'll show you uh, what the priest says at the, on the next slide so you have an idea of how you prepare your heart correctly to celebrate Palm Sunday. A commemoration is not simply a reminding or a calling to mind of something that happened in the past. It's not just a, you know, a, a simple honoring of a historical event, but in some ways, 
we enter into this historical event. We we participate in it. We 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 are present to it in a in a very unique way. So this this is a commemoration of the Lord's entrance into Jerusalem, and it may take place in three different forms. The the, the most dramatic is the one people recall where there's an outdoor procession usually that uh, brings the people across the threshold of the church and into to various songs of praise to God. And then the, the mass continues on the inside of, of the church. That solemn procession you may find is not going to be observed in many churches this year because of the pandemic. It's very hard to space people apart in an appropriate distance. So if your parish does not offer it this year, uh, it's one of the sacrifices that we make and we, we pray we'll be back to normal again by Palm Sunday of 2022. The, the second form of the procession is where everybody gathers inside the church. The priest remains by the door inside the church and he says the opening prayers there. So it's, it's much the same as the outdoor procession except the, the music is shorter and obviously the procession is shorter. But the third form is the kind of one, one that most people don't do at all. It, it, uh, it's quite abbreviated. It does not include a blessing of branches uh, or the proclamation of that first gospel of the event of Palm Sunday. This simple uh, way to begin this, this third form, you may actually find in use in your parish churches this year a little bit more than in the past, especially if there's a desire to get people in and out in a shorter amount of time. Um, it's, it is a, a way of celebrating this mass that focuses almost completely on the passion because the opening rituals surrounding the palm branches are extremely simplified. They're, they're whittled down to nothing more than the recommended entrance antiphon for the day, which remembers the entrance into Jerusalem, but everything then is about the passion of the Lord from, from this moment on. Nonetheless, the, the liturgy calls this uh, a commemoration. And here's what the priest says to help explain the, the concept of this day. He says in these or similar words, since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable works with all faith and devotion, let us commemorate the Lord's entry into the city for our salvation, following in his footsteps, so that being made by his grace partakers of the cross, we may have a share also in his resurrection and in his life. So notice the, the, the words here that we, we have been preparing by penance and charitable works, and I'm, I'm confident you all are doing that now. Every, every penance you offer right now, every charity or almsgiving you give to somebody right now, all of this is preparing you for these words on Palm Sunday. And then we're going to commemorate the Lord's entry into the city, following his footsteps. So we're, when we enter the church, we are following the footsteps of Christ into the holy city. The, the church is a symbol of Jerusalem, and we, we enter into the city as if Christ were, into the church as if Christ were entering his city, and we are following him with all faith and all devotion. But then notice how this instruction turns. We are going to share his cross. He's entering Jerusalem not for all this glory and palm branch waving, but because he's going to embrace his cross. And we need to be ready to do that as well. I'm sure every one of you can think of a cross that you are carrying right now and how you are sharing in this cross of Jesus Christ. So his promise is that we will also share in the resurrection and in his life. All of this we call to mind as we begin the commemoration of the Lord's entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The, uh, the last slide I wanted to show you for Palm Sunday concerns the passion. Uh, I just want you to see how differently the, the church treats the passion. So some of you may be deacons or lectors, readers in your, in your own parishes, and you may be very familiar with how the liturgy of the word goes. 
but there are certain things that happen on this day and again on Good Friday that are just different. So when the procession begins, the, the deacon or, or the priest, whoever is walking to the, to the ambo, uh, walks over there without candles and without incense. Uh, he gives the introduction, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark, it will be this year, but he does not say, the Lord be with you, and he does not sign the book with his thumb, kind of showing that, uh, you know, there was tracing the sign of the cross three times. Let me talk about each of these in, in a moment here. Uh, the Lord, we, we, we don't say the Lord be with you because we're about to enter the passion. We're about to really enter into it, and the Lord will die in this passion. So the the greeting the Lord be with you seems a little inappropriate at, at the beginning because he is a we, we're about to commemorate his death. And then we don't indicate the signs of the cross because we're going to be witnesses of the cross, the, the cross of Jesus Christ and his, his own death for our sakes. So with these, these removals from the beginning of the, of the proclamation of this particular gospel, we are immediately drawn into something special, something mysterious going on here that is calling us to understand more, more deeply what the meaning of this crucifixion is. Now, different people may read it. It's often divided among three readers. Uh, uh, it may be lay people who, who do it. If possible, the part of, the, of Christ is given to the priest. Traditionally, three deacons have proclaimed the passion. You may see three of them uh, vested in, in doing it in, in some very special ceremonies. But, um, but normally, the, the priest would be the one to, to pr perform the role of, of Christ. And then at the end of this account, the, the, the main reader says the gospel of the Lord. Now, this is a little bit different, even though it's, it's the same the, the way that, that uh, a gospel ends. It's a little different from the way it, the, the beginning of the Passion happened. We, we began just with a declaration that the Passion of, the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be read, not a reading from the gospel, but this is something very special, the passion. And then it concludes with this acknowledgement that this is the gospel of the Lord, the good news. Even though we have just heard the, the death of Christ, we do call this Good Friday, and ultimately it will be good news. So the, the ending includes this dialogue. We say, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, because somehow mysteriously he is still with us. But the book is not kissed as we do in the other in the other rituals. It is just left kind of suspended in this moment of, of great awe. So Palm Sunday, the Lord's Passion, draws us into the mystery of Good Friday already. The, the church in her wisdom knows that not everybody is able to return to worship on Good Friday, but knows that it's very important that all Catholics hear the account of the passion of the Lord. So it is given to this Sunday, especially for those who will be unable to return until next Sunday, that they don't hear the news of the resurrection without first hearing the news of the cross. And that comes first for, to our ears on Palm Sunday of the Lord's passion. Let me reflect a little bit with you on Holy Thursday's Mass of the Lord's Supper. This is a very uh, warm and popular celebration because we Catholics love the Eucharist, and this gives us a chance to honor it by our celebration of it on the, uh, on, on the day that, that uh, Christ instituted it. There are several things that make Holy Thursday unique as a day. Funerals may be celebrated, but only without Mass and without communion. So if Sadly, someone has died and the family needs to arrange a funeral on Holy Thursday. It may be done, but not with mass. Now, sometimes people will understand this. These are special days for us. And uh, you know, I, I think a, a simple catechesis on it will, will help them to know. But it's good for everyone to be prepared for this. And we'll see the same is true on 
uh, Good Friday and Holy Saturday, it's it's possible, but um, we 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 have to avoid the celebration of Mass because the evening Mass has such importance for us. If someone is sick, unable to receive communion at Mass, they are eligible to receive communion at home or in the hospital uh, outside of Mass. And I'll say a little bit more about this in, in a few moments, but just know for right now that it is permitted on, on Holy Thursday. Before this Mass begins, the tabernacle should be completely empty. So the, the vision is that people walk into the church, there's no reserved sacrament this night, and everybody who receives communion receives communion consecrated at the Holy Thursday Mass of the Lord's Supper. So we are participating to the fullest degree possible in this sacrifice of the Mass. This is something the general instruction of the Roman Missal hopes that Catholics would do in general, that we would always be able to receive communion, not from the tabernacle, but from the host consecrated at the altar for the sake of participating in the Mass to its fullest, but it's actually uh, required on Holy Thursday. So the, uh, the tabernacle is empty. There will, there will be no reserved sacrament. We have plenty of hosts consecrated on this day. So everyone who celebrates the Mass of the Lord's Supper receives communion at this celebration of the, of the sacrifice. In addition, the priest should be consecrating sufficient, a sufficient amount of bread so that Holy Communion can be given on the next day, Good Friday as well. Uh, I don't know if, if you have gone to the Chrism Mass, if you even know about the Chrism Mass, or if you are a kind of Chrism Mass groupie. You, you love to go every year. But once a year, there is a very special Mass generally held at the cathedral of, of any diocese presided over by the bishop, during which he blesses the oils of the sick and of catechumens and consecrates the oil of chrism that we use for our most important celebrations throughout the year. Uh, I know this year, again, because of the pandemic, not many people will be able to attend a chrism mass, but if you're able to watch one on a live stream, you might find it helpful to kind of uh, understand more about the significance of these oils and how critical they are for us. There is a note in the, in the ritual for Chrism Mass that the, the parish should receive the oils in some way. And it could be done at the beginning of the celebration of the, of the Mass of the Lord's Supper, or like just before it, before it begins, these oils could be set into place in, in the parish church. Uh, traditionally, the, the Chrism Mass takes place on Holy Thursday. We have permission now to do it a little bit earlier. Whenever it, it happens, it, it helps us enter into the mystery of the sacred three days, the three days we call the Triduum, because two of these oils will be used for the rites of initiation at the Easter Vigil itself. So these are this is a moment when the parish may be receiving some of the oils that the bishop has just prepared, and they are coming into the church now for the first time, where the whole people of God will be celebrating sacraments with them throughout the, the coming year. So if so, just uh, kind of honor these, these oils as something very, very special that takes place. One of the significant features of this particular Mass of the Lord's Supper is the option for having the priest wash the feet of the, of the people. It is an option. I think most parishes do use it in, in the United States because it is such a powerful symbol. And uh, Jesus said uh, he was giving us an example and expected us to do the same. So uh, our priests remove their chasuble, get down on their hands and knees and pour water over the feet of, of uh, the faithful and, and dry them. It is, it is a very dramatic uh, moment and one in which he imitates Jesus who did this to serve. So some, some people put their priests on a pedestal, some priests put themselves on a pedestal. And this particular event reminds all of us 
that a priest is called to serve. This, this is what he does. Now, during the pandemic, it's unlikely that we will be able to have foot washing in many of our churches this year. But uh, I, I do want you to know about it, how, how significant it is. You will hear the gospel of Jesus washing the feet of his uh, disciples. You will hear him say that he's giving us an example. And really, I think he wanted those disciples to go out and not just physically wash feet, but you know, e emotionally, spiritually, practically wash the feet of others by the other deeds they did, other actions of service. This was following his example, being humble before others and serving them in the way that, that, that we can serve them best. So as you, as you hear that gospel, think about ways that you might put this into practice yourself. How might you humble yourself before others who may you may think are even lower than you, but humble yourself to them and serve them? While this takes place, we, uh, we generally have some singing. Again, this year it may not happen. I wanted to show you this slide partly uh, just as a, a bit of trivia in, in the church, but I think we can also derive an important meaning from this as well. When the third edition of the Roman Missal came out almost 10 years ago, it made a few adjustments to Holy Week, and one of them pertained to these antiphons that it recommended to be sung during the foot washing of Holy Thursday. We used to have six different antiphons here, but the third edition of the Missal restored one that had been dropped. So we now have seven different antiphons, and they also reshuffled them into biblical order. So now they, they appear in the book. They're all quotes from, from the Bible. They, they appear in the Missal in the same order that you would find them in the Bible. But the, what we lost on that is that now the one that's number six is the one that used to be number one. And it's the, it's the chant I've given you a little uh, glimpse of here on, the, on this slide. It begins with the words mandatum novum, and it means a, a new commandment. So you remember the, the words of Jesus, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Now it's because this antiphon, beginning with the word mandatum, used to be the first of the antiphons recommended for the washing of the feet. This is why this ceremony is sometimes called the mandatum, and it's also why in some Christian traditions, what we frequently call Holy Thursday is also called Maundy Thursday, mandatum Thursday, the Thursday on which Jesus gave his new commandment. So as I say, it's a little bit of trivia, but I hope you de derive this insight from it that the the first antiphon the tradition has in mind here, as we are washing feet and taking care of others, is that we are fulfilling the new commandment of Christ, love one another. Holy Thursday is indeed a day in which we celebrate the institution of the Eucharist, but it is also a day when we hear the command of Christ to love our neighbor, to serve our neighbor and to do it with, with great humility. Now, I mentioned earlier that those who are sick are able to receive communion. Look at this new instruction that is part of the third edition of the Missal. At an appropriate moment during communion, the, the communion of the Mass, okay, the, the priest entrusts the Eucharist from the table of the altar to deacons or acolytes or other extraordinary ministers so that afterwards it may be brought to the sick who are to receive Holy Communion at home. So you put this together with the permission that the sick may receive Holy Communion on Holy Thursday and you realize the ideal time for the sick to receive Communion on Holy Thursday is right after the Mass of the Lord's Supper in the evening, just as the people who are worshiping inside the church 
receive communion from the altar of the sacrifice of this mass, so that communion from this mass goes to the homes and it unites together all the people of the parish, even those who were unable to come to the church today because of some infirmity. During the pandemic, we may not be able to do it. We may not have permission to go into the homes. There may be concerns about that, but I lift this up to you as a way of remembering how important this whole ministry of communion to the sick is and can be. After communion, there is a procession through the church. It's recommended that we sing two traditional Latin hymns, the Pange Lingua and Tantumergo. They are not required, but they, they are good uh, pieces of music to have in our repertoire as, as Catholics because they are so important to our tradition. And interestingly enough, those who sing Tantumergo are on Holy Thursday are eligible for a plenary indulgence. This is a very special uh, grace that the church offers us. You can look this up on your own if, if, if you wish, but it is a way that we experience uh, additional uh, uh, indulgence or grace from, from God even after we've been forgiven for our sins. So this is a quick summary of some of the things that are required for, uh, for a plenary indulgence. Uh, there are several opportunities during Holy Week to, to obtain one of these, but only one a day. I mentioned this one because for those of you who are church musicians, you may want to know it's one of the few indulgences that can be gained by singing. So singing the Tan to Mergo is the uh, is the action that is is performed along with these other uh, activities that may then uh, obtain the the plenary indulgence for the for the faithful. Then there's a period of adoration. This is how the Holy Thursday Mass of the Lord's Supper concludes. Uh, the there is a as the procession reaches a tabernacle. Uh, the communion is placed inside, the hosts are placed inside a ciborium in the tabernacle, it is closed, and the priests and the ministers wait for a moment of, of uh, adoration, they genuflect and, and depart. The, the stripping of the altar, the removal of, the, of, of other uh, of, of crosses or the veiling of the crosses, all of that is done after the liturgy. It is not part of the liturgy as, as it used to be. Um, also, the, it's recommended that holy water stoops, the, the fonts for signing yourself with holy water, be emptied after the Holy Thursday Mass. In most of our churches this year, because of the pandemic, they've been empty all year. So we look forward to the day when, when they can be, uh, be restored to us. But between the Mass of the Lord's Supper and uh, the blessing of the new Easter water, there is no holy water in use at the, at the church at that time. The, the time of adoration may extend till midnight, but it goes on without solemnity. So there's no use of a monstrance to adore the blessed sacrament. There are no uh, extra uses of incense or, or multiple candles added on. It's all done very, very calmly at the at the end, once midnight, once midnight has passed. If it continues beyond, it's done without any solemnity at all. So all of this gives you some idea of how we observe Holy Thursday. It is a day in which we uh, celebrate the institution of the Eucharist, but we also meditate on this command to love our neighbor as as Jesus himself demonstrated for us. Good Friday of the Lord's Passion. This is a day that Catholics observe with fast and abstinence. Uh, those who are, see, I think it's between their 18th and 59th birthdays fast, eating only one full meal and the other meals cannot equal the same. But everybody age 14 and up abstains from meat on Good Friday. There may be some other services. You may have tenebrae, the treore service of three hours or the seven last words. Some of these are traditional and you may find people hungering to experience those on Good Friday. But the main service is the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the one I'll speak about here in a few moments. Notice that penance, uh, going to confession, 
and anointing of the sick may be celebrated both on Good Friday and on Holy Saturday, but the other sacraments may not be celebrated. So we can't do weddings, for example, on Good Friday or on, on Holy Saturday. Funerals may take place, but again, without mass and without communion. Holy communion may be given to the sick outside this liturgy. So it's very similar to the rule on Holy Thursday. Those who are sick may receive communion at home. In this case, it doesn't really matter what time of day because there is no special sacrifice of the mass that takes place on Good Friday. The appearance of the church should be bare. Everything should look very, very empty. It, the Missal recommends that the, the Passion be observed at three o'clock in the afternoon. I know people have different uh, choices on this. Some move it up to noon or later to, to seven. The recommended time is three o'clock because that is the hour when the scriptures tell us that Jesus died. A very dramatic opening takes place where the priest and deacon go to the altar, reverence it, prostrate or kneel. Everybody kneels and everybody prays in total silence. This is an image of Pope Francis. He, he probably needs help to get down and get back up again. He's eligible to kneel. He does not have to prostrate. But you can tell this is a very important devotion to him, as it would be for any of us. Uh, as we begin the Good Friday Liturgy, especially if it, it begins at three o'clock, we, we are remembering the death of the Lord Jesus who, who died for our sakes. Later in the service, we have uh, an opportunity to adore the cross. This is a ceremony that we've traditionally called the veneration of the cross. The Missal changed the translation of the word. The word in Latin has always been adore, but Vener venerate the cross seem to make more sense to, to us and what we are doing. And yet there is a strong tradition behind this verb. I want to meditate on it with you for a little bit to help you understand the importance of the cross on Good Friday and the exceptional dignity and reverence that we give to the cross only on Good Friday, only on this, this one day a year. One of the, the great liturgical theologians of the past, Amalarius of Metz, wrote this back in the ninth century, although not every church can possess the true cross, nevertheless, the power of the Holy Cross is not absent in those crosses that were made in the likeness of the Lord's cross. So you don't have uh, the, uh, the actual cross of Jesus Christ in your church. You have a cross fashioned in its likeness. The power of Christ's cross is in that cross, the one that, that you have in your, in your church. St. Thomas Aquinas similarly said, the cross is worshiped with the same adoration as Christ. This is a stunning statement for, for many of us who are told we only adore God, we only adore, adore Christ, and here we are uh, adoring a, a thing, but this is because on Good Friday, the cross has an unusual quality to it. It is uh, a way of entering into the mystery of our own salvation. If you think of this as the, the, the instrument stained with the blood of Christ, then you, you could almost look on the, the cross of Christ, the original cross of Christ, as a kind of proto-monstrance. You know, where, where we use a monstrance to show the body of Christ in a, in a, in a sacramental host, so the, the cross of Christ bore his actual blood and became an object of, of devotion, a, a place where we could actually adore the, the Christ. So it's, it's, a, it's a unique use of this verb adore. It's done only to the cross and only on this day. We don't talk about adoring the cross on any other day. But it's because in some mysterious way, on Good Friday, we are there at Calvary with Christ on his cross, and his cross with his blood is, is what we adore. Here are some of the words from the Good Friday liturgy. You know these very well, but now think about them a little more deeply. The, 
the deacon or the priest may sing, Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. And everyone answers, Come, let us adore. Let us adore the wood of the cross. And then a little later on, one of the antiphons we, we may sing is, We adore your cross, O Lord. This is a hymn that has been part of the Catholic tradition for a long time. At the very end of the service, before the ministers leave, they make a genuflection, not to the tabernacle, but to the cross, to the empty cross. This is, this is what has brought us the absence, presence of Christ here in, in our midst on, on this day. So when we, when we perform this action, even though we, we call it adoring the cross, I, Sometimes people, people ask, well, should the cross have an image of Christ on it or not? Uh, you'll see both things. At, at, the, at the Vatican, they, they use an, uh, a cross with the image of Christ. And yet, the way I read the, the Missal, it, it seems to presume there is no image there because it keeps talking about the wood, the wood. So even if you have an image, it's important to remember you are not adoring the image of Jesus but the wood of the cross, the, the instrument of his salvation, the, the, the empty wood by which we got everything that we possibly could possess. There are different ways to show the, the cross. Uh, the, in the first form, the cross is put in the sanctuary and ministers unveil it. it it's, it's, it's covered with a, with a violet veil and they, they unveil it. And then the second form is to process it unveiled through the church. So you may see one or the other of versions of these. Uh, I, I put this photo on this particular slide deliberately. This is an actual photo from one of the service, one of the Good Friday services in the Vatican from several years ago. The, the missal clearly says we're supposed to use a violet veil. And in this particular year, some, somebody brought out a, a red veil for the, for the Good Friday uh, ce celebration. So uh, th they've corrected it now. If you watch the, the, the video of the, of the Vatican's Good Friday observance, it's a, it's a violet colored veil, not a red one. But I like to show this because it's, it's a, a comforting reminder to me and to all of you, no matter how much planning you do for Good Friday and Holy Week, you're going to forget something. You're going to overlook something, and something's going to happen that you just didn't plan on. Don't worry about it. It even happens at the Vatican, and we are here because we are weak human beings. We're looking at Christ, who was put into a moment of extreme weakness, and he still gave it his all. He gave his sacrifice of himself to the Father. For the uh, time of adoration, the priest may remove his chasuble and shoes when he goes forward. Uh, anybody may adore the cross in any way. Now, I suspect this year with the pandemic will be discouraging people from touching the cross. But if you would like to make a genuflection or a bow of the head or a bow from your waist, that would all be perfectly acceptable. At communion time, we recite the Lord's Prayer. The priest has a private prayer that he says before receiving communion. Um, in Latin on, on this particular day, that prayer omits the reference to the blood of Christ. He usually says this prayer about uh, he, that he's about to receive the body and the blood, but there is no blood of Christ to be drunk on Good Friday. It's only the body of Christ for one and all. Uh, it's recommended that uh, Psalm 22 be sung during communion time or some other communion chant would be, would be perfectly fine. Psalm 22, as you know, is the one Jesus uh, cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So Good Friday is a day of uh, exceptional beauty in which we reflect upon the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the way that he has entrusted his, his love to us. Finally, we'll look at a few highlights from the Easter Vigil. It begins after nightfall. The idea is that it all takes place in the dark because this is when the resurrection happened. So again, we want to be kind of uh, imitating, commemorating these events as best we can. 
Uh, normally, the Lucernarium, the light ceremony at the beginning, calls for a blazing fire. This year, many of our churches are going to take a different permission when, because of difficulties that may occur, a fire is not lit, the blessing of fire is adapted to the circumstances. So we may find many of our parishes, because of the pandemic, not gathering people outdoors around a large fire, but organizing something very simple by the front door of the church, lighting the candle, and then, and then proceeding in. The candle is to be made of wax, and it's supposed to be a new one each year. This is something that uh, some parishes are una unaware of. They, uh, they sometimes reuse last year's candle because it didn't go down very far, but the Paschal candle is one of the symbols of new life and the resurrection and the, the sacrificing of the candle to the, to the flame, the loss of the wax is another symbol of Christ offering himself throughout the coming year. So a new candle and one made of wax, not, a, uh, not an oil candle for the, for the Paschal candle. The incisions are obligatory. The, uh, uh, the priest will cut in the alpha, the omega, the two Greek letters, and the year. Uh, incense grains may be inserted into the candle, but they are not, they are not required. Uh, sometimes parishes have a mission church and they need their own candle. The uh, uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops suggests that one candle be the Easter candle for this particular celebration, but another one is lighted as the other candles uh, are lighted for the, for the congregation. The deacon or the priest sings the light of Christ three times at the door in the aisle and in the sanctuary. Uh, this is a darkened church. You may recall people are generally holding tapers. Again, this year we may find your parish is going to do it very differently, but know that typically you would, you would enter a darkened church. And then after the third time that the deacon or priest sings the light of Christ, the lights in, in the church come on. Now, many parishes don't do that. They, they like to stay in the dark longer by candlelight. They, some even extend uh, the darkness through the liturgy of the word. That's actually not in the, in the rubrics for this mass. Instead, it suggests that the, or asks that the lights come on immediately at this point after the third time the deacon sings Christ our light. So you see that the the Paschal candle has lighted all the candles of the faithful in the church, and by golly, even the electrical light in the church, it's had this tremendous impact, the, the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ upon all of us. Then the deacon or um, whoever is going to, to sing the exultet goes to the ambo or another lectern and sings this. I want to commend this prayer to you as something that you might meditate on sometime between now and, and the Easter Vigil. It is a beautiful summary of salvation history. And if you take some time to pray over it before the Easter Vigil, you will be swept into the meaning of this night as it is sung so beautifully. So do take a, a little time with it to, to understand the significance of this beautiful traditional chant. All nine readings should be proclaimed whenever this can be done for the vigil, but the number may be reduced for more serious pastoral circumstances. Uh, we're certainly encouraging that due to the pandemic that the number be reduced. You can cut back to three Old Testament readings, and if so, they need to come from two different parts of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. Always we hear the story of the Exodus from Easter, uh, Exodus from, from Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, and how people were brought from slavery through water into freedom. And we're hearing in that reading already a foreshadowing of the mystery of baptism. The altar candles are lighted after the Old Testament readings. The Gloria is sung. The bells are rung for the first time. After the proclamation of the gospel, which gives us the good news of Easter from the gospel itself. Then the, the homily is followed by the initiation rites. Catechumens may come forward. Even small children may be baptized on this night. There's a procession of the various ministers that leads to the font. 
where the priest will bless the water. It's during this time when everyone will be invited to renew their baptismal promises. And I like to point this out for you because this is a very significant part of your entire Lent. You're going through this Lent trying to say no to sin and say yes to Christ. So now at the Easter Vigil, you're going to be asked, do you renounce Satan and do you believe? So these questions are going to bring you to the fullness, the full celebration of your Lent. It'll bring your whole Lent to its proper conclusion. The newly baptized will join in the prayer of the faithful, the universal prayer for the first time. They may also bring gifts to the altar. They are now going to be participating in this full sacrifice of the mass for the first time, both sacrifice and communion. Their godparents may be mentioned by name in the Eucharistic prayer, and all the newly baptized may be mentioned as a group in the, in the, in the prayer as well. So I'm going to conclude with a couple of uh, quotes for you pertaining to communion at the Easter Vigil. Those who were just baptized are finally coming to share the Eucharist for the first time. And we who have been baptized are now going to share in the first communion of Easter time. As we have celebrated the resurrection of Christ on this night, our communion is a sacramental sharing in the risen Christ here among us right now. His presence means that much to us. The rite of Christian initiation of adults asks the priest to give a final catechesis to the newly baptized just before they come forward to receive their communion. So I'm going to show you this one that I wrote, and then I'll show you the other one that is being used at the Vatican, and I think is really quite lovely. But the one I'm, I'm giving you as an idea is based on a quote from St. Augustine, and you'll see the quote from Augustine within the quotation near the bottom of this slide. So I would say to my newly baptized, just before I give them communion, my brothers and sisters who are newly baptized, we now come to the moment you have been waiting for, we too have hungered to have you share with us at this table. What we share here is the body and blood of Christ. It guides us and centers us. It is the reason we live. Be what you see and receive what you are. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Then here's the, here's the version that uh, has been used at the Vatican for quite some time. Pope Benedict started using this and Pope Francis uses it as well. I think it's really quite lovely. Same moment, the, the neophytes are getting ready to receive their first communion and the Pope inter interrupts the, the communion rite to say this, dearest sons and daughters, I turn to you who in this glorious night reborn by water and the Holy Spirit, receive for the first time the bread of life and the cup of salvation. May the body and blood of Christ the Lord always make you grow in his friendship and in communion with the whole church. May it be the constant food for the journey of your life and a pledge of the eternal banquet of heaven. I find these words stirring, even though it's not my first communion. Whenever I come to communion, it's good to meditate on these realities, that I am sharing in communion with the Lord and with those who are around me at this table. It is the constant food for my journey in life and a pledge of what I hope I will be able to share in heaven. Thank you all so much. I look forward to a day when you and I can gather around a Eucharistic table, if not in a church, then in the banquet of life that Christ has prepared for us. Thank you for your ministry to the church.